Who is John McGrath? Whoa, that's the most difficult question. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a, normally when you answer that question, there's a lot of um, badges that we, I suppose, associate with ourselves. But just to give you some context, I'm Irish by birth, but I'm South African by choice. I've been to 48 different countries around the world, and I've chosen South Africa as the place I'm, I'm going to live. Um, so that is, uh, I suppose, uh, a defining thing. Um, I'm a martial artist, kickboxer, karate. I rode for Ireland, so I've been a sports um, a sportsman all my life, uh, still am, am today, and I've worked with elite athletes and teams uh, at a world-class level in 10 different sports. And I have a passion for uplifting and unlocking people. I think that's an important thing to get across in, in, in who I am. Yeah, I think. So I think if we go a little bit back into fitness and the sports side of your side of your life, how would you feel that um, how, how important is keeping fitness and a life balance um, in life today? Oh, good question. I think that um, you know, with the world that we live in becoming more, you know, stress levels are increasing. Everything is getting faster. Uh, demands are getting higher, and that we need to keep. You know, to keep a healthy and fitness, I regard that as the cornerstone of a well-lived life. Uh, and that is, a, um, that is something that you've got to get. You've got to do a little bit of it every day. But um, the good news is that there's not an awful lot of it required. Maybe 20 minutes is enough. Um, but you've got to do it every day. And, uh, you know, if, if, if you do it every day, the rewards are huge. Yes. But they're only huge for one day. The next day it's gone again and you've got to repeat and that's it. Why it's yeah. got to be consistent. Exactly. It's, it's, got, it's got to be consistent. But there are so many other good things that follow on from that, you know, if, if, because uh, I think one's physiology determines one's psychology. Yeah. That's a huge thing. So if you want to change your psychology, start changing, you know, what you do, start changing your daily habits and doing some exercise. Uh, people often say to me, oh, it's okay for you, Coach John. I mean, you love exercising. I don't like the thought of exercising. <laughs> if I could find a way out, I probably would too. But I always knew, I always know what it does for me and how good I feel after I work out and how good it feels, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally, all of those wonderful things going on at the same time. So, yeah, I, I regard it as the cornerstone. If you want a cornerstone of a well-lived life, of a life that you want to really do something with, that's your first step getting fit, mm. being healthy. Do you think that fitness also plays a role in being able to heal some of the, the challenges that we face from a health perspective in terms of you know, depression and anxiety, which is, which is on the increase within our society at the moment because of what we are facing and the, the pressure that's being put on us? Yeah, it definitely does. First, I want to talk about um, fitness. Fitness is not necessarily healthy. There are a lot of people out there who are incredibly fit, but it's not necessarily healthy. Um, excessive fitness is actually also unhealthy. So there's a space in the middle, you know, what shall we call it wellness? Yeah. You know, where you train maybe three, four or five times a week for as little as half an hour. And it's not obsessive. Mm. As soon as it becomes obsessive, it becomes, you know, a problem in itself. It actually adds to the stress levels. But it's, if you can keep it, um, you know, to, to that half an hour or 45 minutes or whatever a, a, a day, that helps. I mean, let's look what happens to your, your body and all those positive endorphin chemicals being released in your brain. Um, fantastic. I mean, you will feel better. You'll be able to, your stress levels decrease. You'll be able to handle uh, stress, obviously, the other side, much, much easier. And yeah, it's, it's, um, it's part and parcel. It's not the only part, but it is a massive part of um, wellness and within the context of modern day living, it's, 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 it's gonna become more and more and more important. But um, yeah, we've gotta change how we look at it though as well, so that's a very important. It's not, um, it is what you do, you know, it's, it's the type of training you do also is important. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what would you say for an average person who lives a normal life, they're not looking to be an athlete at the end of the day, but they are looking to introduce some balance into their, or fitness into their life to get that balance that you're talking about. What would you say is a good like, kind of routine for them to be on? Sure. Um, I regard the, the, the HIT principle, I, I, I love this principle, the high intensity interval training type. Uh, I really am a huge fan of that type of, of, of training. Uh, um, I practice it myself, uh, I know it works, 
Um, so you've got to be doing hit maybe two to three times per week. The other thing about it, Megan, is I think it's important to have a goal with it. I mean, we speak about the average person, but there is a, no one who's average in a sense, you know. Mm. And we all come here with a special gift. And within that, I think it's important that, that we choose a goal. And if we have a goal, whatever that might be, it might be running a mini marathon, it might be doing like a half Ironman, it could, whatever that is to you, if you have that goal, you know, it makes getting out of bed that little bit easier on a winter's morning when the mind doesn't want to <laughs> it's move. It's really cold. It's really cold out there. <laughs> I can take the day off. You know, and the mind will look for excuses. And if you don't have something that you have committed to, committed to publicly, you know, so you've got to have those goals in, in conjunction with the fitness program. Because the fitness program itself may not hold up. If, you, if, if you're not tied into a group training scenario, if you haven't paid and committed into something, told others about it, and, you know, then, then you're more likely to move on it. So we, we, the HIT principle is great. If you can go out in nature once a week or twice a week and hike, cycle, whatever that is to you, um, it's got to be varied. It can't be, you know, I'm going into the gym and I'm going to do the same old thing. That doesn't work either. You know, it always amazes me how we have no difficulty paying a couple of thousand a month for your car. <laughs> and yet, yeah. this is the only vehicle that we will ever have in li this lifetime. And we disregard this vehicle and we abuse it. And so I really I want to encourage people to change how they think about themselves, change how they think about this marvelous vehicle. Everybody's got a different one, but it's unique and it's perfect for you. It will allow you to do amazing things and you will have it. It's the only vehicle in this lifetime, so treat it well and re think about how you see yourself and, and how you view your body and, and treat, it with, um, yeah, treat it with care. I want to go back to something that you said about publicly committing. Mm -hmm. How powerful is it to actually publicly commit to something versus, and when we say publicly, we don't mean go and broadcast it on a news. We are talking about publicly committing to somebody that is close to you possibly and saying, I want to achieve this. Mm -hmm. What is the power behind that? Okay. Yeah, um, I spoke to a guy called James Lawrence um, he came to do a talk at, at, at Val de Vie and um, I helped to organize it. James Lawrence did 50 full Ironmans in 50 consecutive days in 50 different states. Yeah, An unbelievable achievement. And one of the things we were talking afterwards, one of the things he said, he never had a problem getting out of bed training for that, which required 8 to 10 hours a day of training for that. For more than a year but right now he's in his off peak you know, he's in his off time for a few months so he just trains for one hour a day for um for the course of that off off time and he's got huge difficulties in getting that one hour a day in because there's nothing at the end of it mm -hmm. there is no, you know there's no goal at the end of that yeah. so that speaks volumes to me uh, it's not just telling a loved one or whatever it's really putting it out there uh, putting it out there on, on your social media say i'm going to do this out with your friends, I'm going to do that. And, and once you have committed, um, then once you've committed to something, the world will conspire to make it happen. And you will have deliberately cornered yourself. We have to corner ourselves. You, know? so you have to corner your mind into scenarios and situations like that. If the mind is not led, the mind will lead. And you've got to corner your mind and say, this is what I'm doing. The mind is a tremendous servant, but a horrible master. And when you corner the mind in and you say, this is what I'm going to do, now you make a plan. The mind comes up with all these great ideas and things happen. And you meet people who are going on a similar journey to you. And just amazing um, serendipity, all the coincidences happen to help you achieve that goal. So you got to commit. As soon as you commit, magic happens. Before that, so. It's always going away, yeah, basically. You're swaying and you're swaying out because you're Absolutely. not ever actually making that decision. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that companies are investing enough in the wellness of their staff? And the short answer is no. <laughs> 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 it's the shortest answer you're going to get today. You know, I think, um, you know, we're in the 
we're in the fourth industrial revolution, the fifth one approaching rapidly, and in a lot of ways we have a first industrial revolution model in how we treat our people, almost like clock in, clock out, all of that, and that's not going to hold up in the new world that we live in, and you can't have a world where every, you know, in many companies, in many corporates particularly, you know, there's a, the expectation is every year that you're going to get a 15 to 20 percent in terms of productivity with maybe less staff, and people are being pressured more and more and more, and, you know, with that, if they don't know how to deal with that pressure and how to, um, you know, l let off some steam, you know, pr problems are going to occur, and, um, many of the corporate model is starting to break and starting to falter and this is part of the of the answer to it in that you must handle the person in in the holistic sense um, in the wellness sense, keeping the person well i mean that's one thing we, we, when i work with athletes the problem may manifest here but the problem initial problem is there and you can't just talk about performance you're dealing with a human being who's got all of us live complex lives. We've got many different things going on in our lives and things that we are, need to be, uh, ways we need to be unlocked, things we need an outside perspective on at, at times. I mean, two minds will always come up with a better solution than one. So there's a, uh, in terms of health, it's not enough even just to put the gym in, you know, because if you put the gym into the space, it's the, going to be the same five gym rats who will use it, you know. You've got to develop a passion for training. You've got to give people a system that works. You can say, hey, you can train for 20, time, uh, 20 minutes here a day, and it can be really effective if you do this. You've got to uh, incentivize it. You've got to let people know about food, you know. Now, nowadays, we no longer um, eat plants. We eat products that are, are, are manufactured in plants. So we've moved so far away and we're so disconnected from what we eat. Um, and all of those in terms of mental, mental health, um, yeah, in terms of physical, but also in terms of just to broaden the space and, you know, in, 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 into contribution. You know, how wonderful it is if you're in a, in a space where you're actually giving something into the community as well. How wonderful is it if you can fulfill your employee's purpose in life? Too many times we've got square, you know, round pegs and square holes, and, yeah. and I mean, you know yourself how if you there's nothing worse than almost being in your it just doesn't fit and it's frustratingly close. Um, your purpose is very is is very specific, and to help people find that and to guide them into that, there's so many ways that we need to to change this model. And uh, the, the short answer again to get back is no, there's not enough. Um, there's only so far, you know, that you can drive, and then you've got to get back into into working with people, and um, that's complex. And so that's why often times it's ignored, and it's easier to say I want this and I want that, but that won't last. So when we we spoke about you, we spoke about the food side of things, and it brings up a question of, uh, you know, across Europe, for instance, you're very educated on the packaging of something before you buy it. Mm -hmm. It seems that in South Africa we tend to not necessarily provide that same form of information necessarily for the customers in the stores. Is that, where do you see that impact? Should that be something that should be almost a global standard that people are able to understand a bit more yeah. about the nutrition in which yeah. they're buying? Absolutely. Um, there's too much jargon and a lot of it is obf like being obfuscated, you know. The, the, uh, um, I think there is um, 40 different ways of calling something sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, it's, it's got to be very clearly defined in um, non-jargon, uh, in, in layman's terms, what's in it and how much of it, you know, and after that is uh, people are entitled to make their own, you know, things that are, are sugar-free. I mean, I get very scared of something if it tastes that sweet and it's sugar-free sometimes. I, I was like, what on earth is in that? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that would be a good idea. But beyond that as well is, you know, the promotion of health even in schools. It's one thing, a lot of what we learn in schools, we don't necessarily carry with us into adulthood at all. But, I mean, do we need to be educated about how our own body works, the food type of food that it really um, it loves to work with? I mean, that's, these are important issues as well. So we need to look 
um, outside of we need to think outside of the box on this and uh, promote health and wellness from a very young age and get people into I mean it, you know whatever you do in the first seven to fourteen years of your life is more likely to continue doing yeah. and you know physical activity is more often decreasing in a lot of school activities that rather than increasing so that's um, that's another concerning trend to, um, yeah on that they could consider doing something like bringing in more healthier options in tuck shops. Like, for sure. That, that, I think that's a big one for me. I mean, Huge. I literally put my little two-year-old into a crash and, you know, they have a tuck shop on a Friday. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a way in which they also teach kids to obviously learn to control money in the sense of you can only mm -hmm. get what you've got. Yeah. So you can only get enough for the 10 mm -hmm. rand or the 5 rand mommy sent to school today. But is there healthy options that we're giving them that they can actually choose for that five or ten rand? And that's maybe something that they can start introducing into schools? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, we've got to put the pressure back on the schools for that. You know, the unfortunate thing is that, you know, um, healthy food rots fast, you know. But we've got to put pressure on to, to, to make sure that that happens. And, I mean, that's up to parents to pressure, uh, to get pushback on that. Um, you know, to make sure that the amount of things that you can do that's healthy, that tastes good, is now is phenomenal. And people need to be exploring these things and um, prioritizing these things in, in your life because um, obesity is on the increase. Obesity is the biggest killer in the world right now. It's killing more people than all the wars in all the world put together right now. Because it causes all the diseases yeah, and the challenges all of them. that people have all from, of them. from actual health there. And I, I was reading some alarming statistics uh, recently that um, by 2050, 80% of men, adult men and women, will be obese. And when we say obese, there is that thing where you can be thin, but you're still obese. Yeah, uh, um, you can be. <laughs> <laughs> you can be skinny fat. Yes. <laughs> yes, I think that's what it's called. You can be skinny fat and you can still be uh, obese, yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's not a place you want to be. Uh, and We've got serious turnaround to do, and uh, South Africa is gaining fast on the indices of that. Yeah, so um, it's across all um, cre race, creed, and color. It's all on the increase, and some people think, oh, oh it's also you know in, across socioeconomic as well, uh, not just poor people eating, making bad food decisions. This is wealthy. Uh, the, the wealthy are also, the curve is also on the up. So right across the board, we've, we've got to um, prioritize health, prioritize it in terms of food, in terms of exercise, in terms of mental and, and, and physical well-being. So if I can come back to you as a life coach, um, you said that you have a method or a theory of how you are able to unlock greatness. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit more about that because I think you know that turns into somebody finding their purpose and mm -hmm. one of the greatest challenges I think and I've even experienced myself is almost to understand well what is my purpose? Like you come on and everybody's like oh you've got to have your purpose but yeah. then, like you kind of sit there and you're like well where do I find the purpose? Like you can't really go to a shop and buy it. <laughs> yeah that's I mean that's such an interesting question. I think Picasso said the purpose of life is to find your purpose um, and so it's not something that you can perhaps you know go off for a, a walk and just think about it. It's it's something that will come to you over time. There are a few things about it that um, I think we know, for instance, as even as children, we have an idea of what it is. We have a dream about our lives. And often at times, that's whacked out of us, you know, by somebody else's opinion of what our purpose is. You know, so if a child tells you, I want to be uh, a pilot one day, you must say, you be, you can do that, you know, instead of saying, oh, don't talk silly. Many times we whack it, we whack it out. Every child can sing and dance. But by the time they're 14 or 15, they've lost a lot of that belief. So let's start for, with it from there. The other thing I'd like to do is, you know, you can ask a person, or ask yourself, if I, never, if I never had to work and I got paid to do something, what would I do? If you never had to earn the paycheck, what would you do? That's an interesting, you know, if you're asking about exploring. And finally, I would ask as well is what, instead of asking what you want from life, ask with what life wants from you. What does the world need of me? You hear? Very powerful question to 
Yeah. <laughs> and you're here for a purpose. And we're all here for a purpose. And when you're in that purpose, your life opens up. And your power to connect with people, your power to move people in a positive way, opens up. When you're not in that purpose, the opposite of that happens. And so we're, you know, we're encouraged to go after certain things in life. Um, oftentimes we swap our life for a paycheck. Kill the dream. I think the Dalai Lama said, um, the greatest problem is that <clears throat> we live as if we're never going to die and die having never lived. And that's the problem with the modern world. But there does come a point where even if when, when you're chasing that dream, mm -hmm. you still need to survive, you need to live. So you mm -hmm. almost need to manage the risk between, I have to have my full-time job doing what I do, yeah. while you start up trying to follow your dream. How do you maintain that balance mm -hmm. and, and manage that risk of going after your dream? Um, that will mean different things for different people. Different, we all have different risk assessments, etc. People will sometimes say to me, you know, but you don't understand, Coach John, I've got kids. I say, I do understand. You've got a responsibility to, for those kids. You must follow your dream. You must follow your purpose. But I do get that um, you, know, you may not be able to get, go cold turkey with it immediately. Whatever you give attention to, or intention to, will grow in your life. So just by starting with one hour a week, if it's music, you just, or whatever, if it's whatever, whatever that is to you, you start to flow with it, you start to put more into it, and whatever you give it will grow. And you can grow it to such a stage as you're now doing it part-time. That may be able to fit in with your own job. Some people's purpose may not be you know, necessarily like full-time. They may still hold their job, but in that purpose, that thing that makes them feel alive is enough. So there's certain things that make you feel alive, and then you can possibly hold a job down as well, and maybe the two of them work together. Um, but it, that will be different things to different people. I work with one guy, and he's happy. He, f he always wanted to be in music. And like he's a CEO of a, of a big company, and he's happy to go out and play drums on a Friday night with a band. And that makes him feel alive. It's his thing. And it's so opposite to his opposite. day job. <laughs> and I, I can imagine the release must be just phenomenal, you know, letting everything go. It's like, for me, it would be like hitting the punch <laughs> bag, hit, you know, whacking those drums. But that, that's his release. And it's like it's a catharsis that allows him to breathe again and feel, feel alive. But it is a very important thing. Um, you know, we live in life, we're encouraged to go for the, the things that are immediate, you know, social media be a TV, get this, wear that, eat this, drink that. And we put so much little thought into what we're here to do. And when you're following that, that purpose, you, you, you change your own life and the lives of everyone else as well, because you're, you're a different person. But from a, from a business coach perspective, how do you manage the situation when, a, when you know that somebody has a dream, but mm -hmm. you also feel that that dream is unrealistic? So, you know, there is that part where you've got to motivate them and you've got to say, yes, go for it. But there's also that part where you've got to say, I know, like, not everybody can sing to the level that they're going to become international superstars, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. how do you almost manage that, that risk with them as a business coach? I've also uh, heard many international superstars that can't sing. This is true, yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of editing yeah, in the background. Yeah, like, um, <laughs> so um, it was a band, it was before your time. Uh, it was called the Sex Pistols. Uh, Sid Vicious was the guitar player. Like I could pl barely play guitar. He was horrible, but he played it with such passion that you know that they became one of the big, greatest groups in the world. If it is your thing and you play it with passion, you will succeed. Nothing will stop you if it is your thing. I'm not saying you're going to be. Um, you know, the, the world-class rock, rock star or whatever, but you can do enough from that. There's enough in that to fulfill your needs if you follow your thing. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been given it. And it's a lack of, a lack of faith. The test is, do you have, can you follow it? Is it it's not like, oh, I, okay, guys, I, I'm going to do my thing today. 
when you start that journey, you know, you're going to encounter a lot of difficulties and a lot of upsets and a lot of things can go wrong. It's not the safe choice, but it's who you become while traveling that journey that will also define who you are and give richness and context to your purpose. Does that make sense? Yeah. How, how would you, though, advise somebody when you, you go into all of those, those challenges and those head-on? Because they, they can literally rip most people's dreams away from them. Because the moment you hear the first no sometimes or you mm -hmm. get five no's, I think by the end of that, you just, you're like, okay, people really just don't like me or I'm not mm -hmm. doing it right or I'm just not getting it right. How do you almost say overcome that? Because on that sixth phone call, that's when it's actually yeah. going to happen. Yes. The, the, well, I mean, that's, that's grit. And you've got to have the mental fortitude to be able to keep going. Um, you look like the Colonel Tom Parker, who, um, who invented KFC. I think he went to more than 1,000 fast food restaurants before one of them chose. Edison had 1,000 failures. Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player of all time, is in the top 10 with so many different stats. He's in the top 10. That's what makes him the greatest. But he's only number one for one thing. And that's the most shots missed. He's number one for that. So he missed more shots than anybody else, any professional basketball player that ever lived. Yet he's the greatest. So your advice would be just to keep going? You keep going. That's how you <laughs> view it. You've got to have grit. You've got to, you've got to keep going. And don't let anybody talk you out of it. And the whole world will try and talk you out of it. The whole, that's part of the journey. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. But it is not easy, but everybody can do it. Surround yourself. I mean, you know, the important... Uh, surround yourself with those who are doing it. Surround yourself with those who will inspire you to do it. Find a mentor in that role. Be careful of friends and family. A lot of, it's not that, you know, the people who know you at, the, at where you are sometimes don't want to let you go on that. Just be careful of that. And when you surround yourself, they say you become the average of the five people you spend the most time with in the world in every way, shape, and form. If you want to be an incredible guitar player, surround yourself with incredible guitar players. If you want to be a great athlete, get in the company of great athletes. George Washington said, pay any price to be in the company of incredible people. That do what you'd like to do. Yes. That's part of the key. You will like subconsciously. In martial arts, in, in karate, there's a saying, Ishin Doshin, from my soul to your soul. It's nonverbal communication. And with that, there's something changes in you. Transferring of the energy, basically, mm -hmm. as well, that they speak mm -hmm. about. Yeah, it's a transfer of the, uh, of the energy. It's like um, that Mara Williamson quote he said, as, as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give others the right to do the same. And to let your own light shine and not to be afraid of what other people think about it and say, oh, look at him, look at her. So w with that whole look at him and look at her, you know, we, we are under severe pressure, and as time goes by, that's just increasing. And it's, it has been said that, you know, we're almost medicating too quickly. We're, we're giving a tablet to somebody to take it for their depression or mm -hmm. their anxiety. How, how do you feel? Well, firstly, do you agree with that statement um, or not? And then how do you feel that we should be addressing it? Okay, so look, I've, I've got a, a personal opinion on, on that. Um, I think it was the, the inventor of, of modern medicine, Hippocrates, said, um, let food be your medicine. And we go back again to the food. There's enough in food um, to heal us. Um, I also follow um, an intermittent fasting protocol. So uh, personally, um, I don't eat for 16 hours of the day. So I only eat, you know, between 12 o'clock in the for me in the afternoon, until maybe 8 o'clock at night. So I, I think that allows your body to heal as well. But a lot of the medicine keeps you in a certain space and keeps you just from going over the edge and just... Um, but it'll never allow your brilliance to come through. And we're living in a world that's increasing. We're medicating ourselves off the charts. And I, I don't agree with it. Um, there's a lot of other um, measures that can be taken, including fasting, including diet, including exercise. Many different ways as well, natural ways of doing things that people must investigate. 
And you cannot, you know, you can't hand power of your body and your consciousness and mind over to other people and expect them, you know, to always do the best for you. There comes a stage where we've got to accept responsibility. And right now, accepting responsibility for wherever you are sitting listening to this, you're responsible for your life up to this moment. And you accept everything and own everything that you've done. Good, the bad, the ugly. doesn't matter. You can't change the beginning, but you can't change where it's going to go from now. We're all the, direct, the directors in our own movie. But if you don't take responsibility, you are the director, editor, and you're responsible for the storyline. And it's wherever you want it to go, wherever, whatever dream you want to picture, that's what will happen. We, we, we become the most predominant thoughts that are in our mind. We become. So with that in mind, you know, um, you know, you, the average person has 80,000 thoughts a day. 80% of those are negative. So if you wonder why people as they grow older seem to get more cynical and get more negative, it's because that amount of negativity over time is going to increase. And if you're 80% negative thoughts, I mean, our, we are our thoughts made manifest. That's who you are and that's who I am. Our predominant thoughts made manifest. So if our predominant thoughts are negative, guess what? Garbage in, garbage out. And you have to consciously, every day, change that loop. Make a change. Constantly choose to think positively about yourself, about what you're going to do, and to state very clearly who you are, what you're going to do with your life. And if you don't do that, it's going to, you know, that's why people get um, more cynical, more grumpy, more ill, all of that made manifest over time. So I think, I think off the back of that, though, I think one fear that a lot of us face is that we're not good enough. And mm -hmm. I think you must hear that as a life coach very often, that people just say, you know, I'm not enough. I'm either I'm not thin enough, I'm not prettier enough. In, yeah. in a girl's world, that's what they go through. In a yeah. guy's world, I'm not. Big enough. In a guy's world, sorry, I'm not a guy. But, yeah. Yeah. but it's, it almost comes down to the fact of, like, how do you overcome that? Because almost your first step that you have to overcome is mm -hmm. to believe that, you know, I am enough. I am enough and I can do this. I might mm -hmm. not start at the end goal, but mm -hmm. you have to start somewhere in order to get to that end goal. Yeah, you're, you're right. Um, I think you, you mentioned a few, you put a few, a few important things in there, and it is, you know, what's driving all of this? Um, so the world drives a scenario where that you're never tall enough, you're never pretty enough, you're never skinny enough. You, as a, a man, you're never big enough, you're never uh, whatever, 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 you know? And so they always have a product to sell you, yeah? Because if you believed that you were beautiful, I mean, there wouldn't be any products to sell. You know, think about it, if diet foods worked, what would be the outcome? Yeah. yeah? So it's the same thing to look back on it. Um, and it comes to a stage where you say, you know, that again, you've got to take responsibility and take your life back and say, like you said, I, I, I am good enough. And beauty is a very strange thing. Uh, you know, our, our, our man, it's for a man or a woman, um, I think it's got to do with you know, a sense of presence and a sense of you know, internal confidence that behind the thin veneer of the makeup or, or, or whatever, lies somebody who does believe in themselves. We all don't believe in ourselves all the time, okay? We all have moments of self-doubt. We have, oh, I feel this and that and the other. But, you know, when you begin to change your internal dialogue, you can begin to change. And there's nothing, uh, there's nothing quite as, as, uh, as sexy, I guess, as a, as a confident, open person. It's, it's, it's got a, a, a tremendous attraction. And that's available to all of us, regardless um, of your height, of your body type, or whatever. It's who you are on the inside that really, that really counts for so much. Yeah? And beyond all the superficial stuff, I think that's an important thing for people to be aware of that. Um, it always was and it always, uh, always, always will be. And to resist those pressures, because these are 
but fleeting things they come they go how you look will change you know radically over the course of of your life but how you will feel inside how you will feel you know when you give to the community how that makes you feel what kind of a person that is how you feel when you exercise how you feel when you encourage others how you feel you know when you explore your internal spiritual um, journey all of these things you know make up the kind of person that you are so there's an awful lot within our control some things we can't change our height certain things you can't change but we can really you know change you know a lot of the the character of who we are is is up for grabs so well you could buy six inch heels to you know change your height yes. <laughs> <laughs> but um going into a little bit on the life coaching side so mm -hmm. life coaching can be seen as very fluffy and, and a mm -hmm. few people also don't really know what it means and also there's a lot of people out there that are calling themselves life coaches mm -hmm. so just talk to us a little bit on that side of firstly what you should be looking for what is the purpose of life coaching and you know how, how do you know if they're a good coach or not because yeah. also the person needs to match the coach mm -hmm. yeah I, I got into it through the back door you know because i work with so many different athletes and um so uh whew. I think the first thing is that you'll feel you've got to feel uh, connected to the person you're working with. You've got to believe in them, and they've got to believe in you. These are an important. That's an important starting point. Um, if a person doesn't believe in your dreams, you know that th that's not a good starting point uh, from the outset. The second thing is you've got to um, be even a coach. People often expect the life coach to be perfect. That they must be fit healthy, driven, strong, they must have all the things that, that you have. And, you know, but remember, you know, no more than the football coach is, you know, um, the great, need, it's not necessary that the football coach is the greatest footballer of all time. Um, so, you know, you've got to be, it's there, there to help to guide you. And one shouldn't be always, you know, judging, judging the coaches. Um, but my sense is, is, is that you have a connection with a, with a person that that person will believe in you, that that person will challenge you, that that person will take you out of your comfort zone, um, but not into your panic zone, and that they will be able to put scaffolding and structure around your life that you don't have. Because we're all very good to see other people's lives. We're all experts in everybody else's life. But we don't often have, see our own life. Yeah. We don't have, that's the, you know, that's why everybody actually needs help in in that regard where and mentorship and and, and coaching um, every coach uh, has a coach and I have many of them and um, in all different spheres of, of my life so I think that these are the important things to, to, to look for the connection the person who's going to help you and 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 hold you accountable encourage you somebody whose purpose is to be a life coach so you normally will find each other. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, Bruce Lee famously said that if you were to spend your first year looking for the correct master, it would be the greatest year of your martial arts journey. So again, I mean, looking for a coach, you don't don't randomly pick the first person you see or that pops up and necessarily on, on 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 Google search or whatever. I mean, interview people, talk to people and you'll find the right one for you. I've also heard that apparently one of the things to look forward to when you're looking for that master in whatever field it is, look for somebody who's already done it. Mm -hmm. And look for yeah. somebody who almost has the experience to be able to back whatever they're saying and not necessarily somebody that hasn't done it. Yes. Um, it's like going to a personal trainer who doesn't train themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's quite a contradiction that, is, that uh, we have to yeah. And you do, you do see them. <laughs> I mean, you, see, uh, you see it in all walks of life, people who are not in um, congruent with what they say. And so, I mean, that, that is part of the investigative process to meet people, do some research and find out you want to be with somebody who inspires you, who motivates you, who pushes you. These are the, this is the person you want in, in your corner. Who do you want in your corner? If it was in a boxing match, you would want a really good coach who believed you, motivated you, was like literally in the ring with you. And these are the, the people you need in, in your life. And yeah, experience does count. It counts for a lot. Do you believe that coaches should form part of human resource departments, that we need to evolve the workplace and the structures in which we have and put life coaches actually as a permanent employee almost, 
or permanent contractor within an organization? Mm, I'm biased, of course, to say <laughs> it, you know from the start, but I would say, I would say yes. Um, I mean, I just, uh, I mean, I know from my own experience in, in places where I go um, that, yeah, yeah, your day is full. Let's let's put it that way. Your day is full, and there you can never leave. Um, there's always more needs to be done. So I mean, it 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 it's something that they've. Uh, a lot of companies are starting to move on that direction, and you've got to have some consistency. So it's okay to have somebody who comes in and fires you up and motivates you, but that you know starts to to you know to fade. And sometimes quickly. Whereas if you have somebody who can consistently hold you to certain different variables in your life, and say, "How's your fitness going? And how is that going?" and you know, and it's somebody who knows a little bit, it's important. They say, I've heard it said that a good a good coach knows a bit about a lot and a lot about a bit. And so, if you're going to be a great coach and you're asking, you know, the person you're dealing with about health, you've got to know about health. If you're asking them about financial freedom and encourage them, you've got to be like financially free. You can't be uh, hundreds of thousands of rands in debt. If you're going to ask them about what are they doing in terms of making a contribution to society, you've got to be making some contribution yourself. So you've got to be congruent with what you're saying. And, and, and if you are that, and that you can have that about you, then you can really make differences from, from people, yeah, with people, should I say. So we, we spoke about, you know, life coaches being in the workplace and we're saying that there needs to be a consistency in terms of motivation. So mm -hmm. a life coach will come in, they come in for one day, they spend half an hour to an hour with the employee, mm -hmm. but there almost needs to be a responsibility that the leadership team takes on as well to con to almost continue what the life coach is also trying to achieve, but more so relating to the professional side. Would you agree with that? And if so, what would you see that their role needs to be? So obviously not going financial freedom on somebody, mm -hmm. but yeah. more definitely on the professional career side. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, if you're a manager, or if you're, you have a, um, a duty to grow people in whatever that means. That can be technically, it can be, you know, with, with, with finances, it can be in terms of, of maturity, in terms of how you deal with certain scenarios and how you work with people. And so there's, um, there's a big onus on, 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 on the management for that, to grow you as, as a human being. There's many different courses, etc. You can do many different things that you can do, and and they must be focusing on that. And they have to have a relationship because it's all about relationship uh, as well. And if they have a good relationship, if they're in touch, if they know what's going on. I'm not saying that you sit around like fuzzily and chat for hours every day. No need. Um, they've got to be in. They've got to be in it. You feel it if they're not. And you know we can very easily. Don't ever underestimate people's ability to be able to judge between sincere and insincere in, in, in people. And you've got to be sincere. You've got to be for that person's growth. And if you're for that person's growth, sometimes that means that they leave. But it, it doesn't matter. Somebody else will also come in. If you are for growth and you let things grow, that you will lose some. But you also gain some in. You, know, you get more people in and you've got to have that growth mindset mindset about the business and growing people because it's all about the people it's seldom about the product it's about the people and what would be your advice to leaders in companies like if, if you had to say tomorrow start doing this one thing and it will change things going forward what would that be start start um, have a vision for your people and communicate that vision clearly and let your people be part of the vision and part of the journey in it as well. I think that's what changes. If people feel that they are connected into, we all f need to be connected into something and to be inspired by something. And the leader's job is to point the direction and to be able to show people and guide people through that valley. And people will, people will follow a great idea to the end of the world, to the end of the earth. And from a people perspective then, what would be the one thing that you'd recommend as of tomorrow that they should start doing to start changing their lives? Or even now, what's wrong with now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right now there's a whole world available to you. There's a vast, there was never so much information and knowledge available in the history of the earth as what's available to you. And never so much disinformation. And you're responsible for that. Take responsibility for your health. 
in your wealth, in all other aspects of your life, what contribution you're making. Take responsibility. Get a plan. Make a plan. If you don't have a plan for your life, someone else will. Take responsibility and make a plan. So I think then in closing of this interview, um, I'd like to ask you to share one of the most inspirational stories that you have to inspire people to know that where you are today does not mean this is where you're going to stay, but rather where you are today could be the start of where you could, could take you to your dreams eventually. Yeah. Um, the opportunity is often in, in the setback. And in, um, in terms, uh, when I lived in Ireland, I had a massive financial setback in 2006. I invested all my life savings in property. How could you go wrong? <laughs> property in Ireland increased 7% um, uh, per annum over 70 years. And within a year and a half, I had lost my life savings. Everything, right down to my car, gone. Then you discover who you really are. And, you know, if that's the one, then, you, then you've got to get, you know, you've got to get real. And with that, you've then, you know, you either make a decision to do what you love to do. When it's all out of the way now, when that happens. And I made a decision to, to do what I love doing and to do it full on. And from that, um, you know, from seeming disaster, I don't know if I would be here in this country if that didn't happen. I don't know if I would have encountered the people. It forced me to grow in a way I never thought I could grow. It forced me to get out and, you know, doing public speaking with people and forced me to, to follow my passion. So from absolute, um, and I think in Chinese, the, the crisis and opportunity has, has the same word, the same way of, of, um, of spelling. So within the crisis, within the obstacle, lies the opportunity. And that is, is, is the same for us all. And we all hit major crisis, midlife crisis, all sorts of crisis. Things you can do. I read about the eagle. When the eagle is uh, at its midlife, its, um, its beak is, is no longer sharp, so it can no longer eat food. Um, its, uh, its feathers are falling. Its talons are no longer sharp. And the eagle faces a decision at that time to either break its own beak off, rip its own talons out, and rip all of the feathers out as well. If it doesn't break this off, it dies. Or this, it dies. So you're faced with a, you're faced with a situation. Eagle lives to be uh, 75 years. And in terms of the human context, there's many things that we need to do. And there's many opportunities to do it. And it isn't, um, you know, you have to be hard on yourself in terms of being disciplined. Remember, you know, the mind that's not led, you have to lead that mind and the mind, you know. So th this is what can be done. The, the obstacle um, is the opportunity in life. And the eagle that can do that will again soar and live on. And that's the story for all our lives. We've all inclined, we've all been smashed. We've all been broken. We've all been had major, major disappointments. But you must change how you look at that and change how you view those things. And when you, you look back and say, that was the moment when I took responsibility. That was the moment when I stepped up. That would be the best advice that I could give. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is some great advice. And thank you very much for joining us on set today with Megan. Um, and yes, we hope to have you back soon and chatting a little bit more about life coaching and just how to keep a good balance. Because I think right now that is what everybody really does need in life is we need that little bit of advice and we need to know, well, what is that one habit we can do today? Mm -hmm. And then in six months time, let's add another mm -hmm. habit to it. Mm -hmm. So we hope to have you back on the show. Love to be back. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Megan. Thank you.